Hey, it's your buddy Mike Squires, and this is the Couchers Podcast, episode number 222. And my guest, the most excellent drummer and musical director, Van Romain. Uh, we talk about his story as a young player and coming up, going to school, how he just sort of basically his just his uh, career arc and which has landed him in some really amazing positions. And uh, most recently, he is drummer and musical director for Enrique Iglesias, as well as for Nana. You can hire Van to play on your recordings, your full record or individual songs, whatever. He also programs. He has Livewire Studio. And uh, I mean, you, you couldn't, you can't do, you can't do a whole lot better than what you're going to get from him. So you can reach out to him through his website, vanromain.com or through the Livewire website. There's a link on his website. I'll put a link in the show notes here. I hope you enjoy and hire him. Hire all the drummers that have been on the podcast this month because they're all amazing. If you are enjoying the Coutras podcast, please support us at Patreon, patreon.com slash Coutras. Your Patreon support is actually what makes this happen. Everything, everything that I do costs money. And if I didn't have Patreon, I, I'm sure that I would still find a way to do it. But it really takes the pressure, the financial pressure off. So I, I very, very, very much appreciate it. It is certainly what makes the videos, the cover song videos happen. So thank you again and again and again, over and over. I would also like to thank a couple of sponsors that the show has picked up. Uh, River City Guitars in Spokane, Washington is a by appointment boutique uh, vintage used guitar shop. If you are passing through, if you are from Spokane, you probably, I'm sure you know uh, about this, this place. And because Bobby is, is a local legend. And uh, if you're passing through on tour or on vacation, you're driving across the country, whatever you're doing, you want to stop in, give them a shout, look them up. You could reach out to them through social media at River City Guitars, follow them on Reverb. They have a ton of stuff that is going up slowly. It's trickling up onto the Reverb store and things go just as fast as they can put them up. So follow them and you'll get notifications when they put new stuff up. If you have a vintage guitar or a used something cool, used boutique thing that you want to sell, get a hold of them. I would not steer you in a direction that I wouldn't go myself. I sold my personal hummingbird through the shop. They are a dream to work with. And that's that. Get a hold of them. Tell them I sent you. Sales.rivercityguitars at gmail.com. Thank you, fellas. I'd also like to thank Variety Coffee Roasters in Brooklyn, uh, New York. Now they have a number of shops, uh, coffee shops throughout Brooklyn and throughout the city of, in Manhattan. Go visit their website and check out their subscription coffee service. You sick of running out of coffee? Shit, I forgot to pick up coffee. Gal diggity dang it. Well, you click a couple buttons, click, 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 and then it just shows up at your house once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, what, you know, whatever you need. And I drink variety coffee every single day. Once again, I would not send you in a direction that I wouldn't go myself. I drink it every day. Uh, I just finished a cup. That's why I'm a blah, blah, blah. Variety Coffee Roasters. Follow them on social. Buy their coffee. Drink it. Be happier for it. Thank you, Variety. You guys are awesome. We're going to get into the episode. Don't forget the golden rule. Treat people the way you want to be treated. It's, I mean, really, it's really that simple. Just treat people right. Treat them well. And don't be a dick. I got Biggie here, Mr. Big, also known as Mr. Big. Is it, you got a pit bull? Uh, this, no, this, this oh. is a. <laughs> oh, Carter, look. Look, who's that? Who is that? <laughs> Uh, uh, Carter is a handsome doggy. Yeah, he is. We had a little work done on him. You know. 
Yeah, a little like some lips and uh, some collagen implants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how long you right. had Carter? I got him like last July. Well, July of uh, 2020, like kind of the oh, nice. Yeah, peak of the pandemic. It was competitive too. That's what I heard. Was that a product? Uh, your decision to adopt a dog, just a product of being home. I yeah. I mean, I grew up with dogs. I'm a total dog person, but I uh, lived in Manhattan for almost 20 years for the music career and didn't want to have a dog there because I loved him too much. And then uh, moved out to Jersey uh, when I had when I had the second child and. Um, um, I was still traveling so much. My wife at, at the time didn't wasn't down with it. Yeah, so. you're gonna leave me here to take care of uh, our uh, child and a dog now. Thanks. I'm like, yes. <laughs> like, what's the problem? Uh, so yeah, during the pandemic, she did end up getting one, and we're, we're happily split up. And um, um, she has one that's here most of the time. She's not yeah. here now, but I but I got him during the. Uh, but I found out it was uh, during the pandemic, but it was so competitive that I um, I actually had to make like a YouTube video of me and my kids with the other dog running, jog jogging in trails off leash. And that's what finally locked him in. But I, I had to like get out of the structure of just writing out applications. I hope that everyone who adopted a dog while they were stuck at home you know, stuck with it and then, and didn't re I hear you. their dogs. I agree. I've been thinking a lot about that, but I've seen a lot of, I, I am like group, you know, friends with some, uh, Facebook groups, you know, like from the shelters and you can see, right. Got relocated, <laughs> but, uh... but in general, the rescue thing compared to the just breeder thing is just mind blowing oh, yeah. to me. Anyway. We have two, we have two rescues. Gotcha. Good, um, good. God bless uh, you for that. Well, we uh, we love dogs. We're <laughs> off to a great start. <laughs> dogs, music. What Welcome else we got? To, uh, well, this is we uh, we're deep into Drummer Awareness Month. Oh, yeah. Good. Uh, which is a thing that only exists here at Couch Riffs. Nice. Drummers don't exist outside of couch riffs. The awareness <laughs> of them, of course, they're like they're like ghosts. If uh, we say a lot, if your drummer sucks, your band sucks, and so they very much exist. Gotcha. Um, so can I park in handicap spots this month or no? <laughs> you, Sorry, it's a, a running horrible, joke. That's like a horrible your, joke. Pop the sticks up onto the dash. That's what I hear. Yeah. What's your favorite drummer joke? <laughs> Um, why did God make drummers just a little more intelligent than horses? Why is that? So, so they don't shit during the parade. I don't know. <laughs> That's just, I mean, everyone's heard every joke. Not everyone's heard that joke. I don't know if it's the best joke, but. Do you know? Well, that's great. I love that one. Uh, you know, the uh, you heard about the drummer who locked his keys in the van on tour? Oh, no, I, I know the accordion version of that or something. Oh, it took an hour to get the bass player oh, out. Oh, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. But the uh, left the left the accordion in the back seat, and someone smashed the window and left a second one in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> now that we've established the ground rules. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have an incredibly impressive resume um, well thank you I'm, i've been uh i'm not religious but i'm spiritual so i feel you know i'm blessed <laughs> yeah i would say so yeah what were uh, speaking of being just smarter than a horse were you in marching mm -hmm. band were you in school band i by the time i got to be that age i was uh more of a uh stoner is that the word um yeah sure but uh, it was the marching band I actually used to practice on my street in my little town in New Jersey growing up. But that's the thing that really sucked me into it when I was, you know, four or five, was watching the drum line. But by the time I was uh, <clears throat> of age of marching, I was like, you know, I thought I was too cool for, for that. Um, but I wasn't interested in marching at that point. I was 
just interested in kind of what I'm doing here, really. You know. <laughs> so you went straight to the kit. Yeah. Yeah, the no. drum lessons, and I had an amazing drum teacher who made it fun somehow. He really loved to teach. He wasn't just teaching because as a as a safety net, because he wasn't, you know, he wasn't frustrated that he was wasn't playing on records and right. doing gigs in New York or whatever the story was. He loved he loved uh, talent and harnessing talent and and encouraging it. And I think he had a lot to do with it too. But um, Aside from you know having maybe a little, a little more than above average uh, natural ability with music, which I lacked in most other things. <laughs> so, so you you took to drums pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. It almost feels like uh, like they chose me, you know, or music right. in general, you know. So. But you think that that marching band thing had a big influence on your on just the appeal. It was the power of the drums and, and, you know, socially, I wasn't thinking along the lines of, you know, is marching in the marching band cool or not cool. But by the time I got to be in, in high school, I was <clears throat> I wasn't interested in that at all. I, but I had to, you know, I had to take I had a feeling I was going to go to and study after high school, study music. So I took uh, like the orchestra class I'm very close with the teacher there. But when marching season came, I would usually play a sport um, just so I wouldn't have to march. Little did you know, being in the marching band, the load-in is way easier than playing the kit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I see like Trent Reznor and Steve Gadd, all these people I idolized. They were, you know, they did all that stuff. So, anyway. Trent Reznor was in the marching band? Yeah. What do you know? What he played? Not sure. I, I know, but the keyboard was his. You know, so he might have played his, the his, uh, mallet instrument. I, I don't know. Yeah, I think I. Yeah, oh, I crazy. shouldn't quote me on that, but I think I just saw something from high school, and he was blabbermouth you know, trying to pick it up. Dressed up in the yeah, uh, <laughs> dressed up in a marching uniform, or could have been Halloween, right? So, um, did your did you have a musical family? Yeah, not professionally, but um, my father is a huge, huge, uh, mostly jazz fan, you know, big band fan and would would uh, took me out to see countless, you know, Stan Kenton, Buddy Rich, Woody Herman, um, on and on and on and tons of you all. You saw all, Buddy Rich. I saw him and my father was fearless. He wanted me to meet Buddy Rich, you know, when I was when it was showing some promise and that didn't always go over so great, you know? Um, but did he have um, any choice words for you? I never actually got up to, but I got pretty close and it was, you know, get that kid out of the dressing room, you know, God rest his soul. I got a lot. I still have so much respect for, for buddy, you know, and, uh, saw him a lot. So, and my mother was also, um, huge uh beatles and uh stevie wonder ray charles fan she would cry when ray charles was on so it, music was around a lot but uh yeah um yeah i was the only one silly enough to actually uh, chase after it but i think it's because i didn't have a lot of other options you know when you started playing and you had your drum kit did you have a place at home that was yeah designated for you to play and how'd that go over yeah. yeah, just uh, I have this theory about drummers. I mean, I've toured with a lot of different bands and a lot of different genres. And overall, I would say, I am answering your question, but <laughs> in a roundabout way, overall, I've found drummers to be the most even keel. It's not in every case, but in general, the most even keel uh, temperament of, of musician <laughs> across the board. And I think that's because, getting back to your question, you know, how many parents would say, uh, so let me get this straight. You want to take drum lessons, even when you sound amazing. If you ever sound amazing years down the road, it's still going to suck for the whole household. And yeah. before that, it's going to be even worse because it's going to sound like drum set falling down the stairs. Sure. Yeah, do it. We'll buy you the kit and we'll pay for lessons. So I think a lot of, you know, people that the drummers got in general, they got a lot of love from their uh, their parental units, whatever. 
That's, that's my what theory. I'm starting to learn. Yeah, but I might be wrong. <laughs> that's what I'm. I I haven't talked to any drummers who who didn't at least have uh, a childhood of in a home that played a lot of music. Yeah. Like your parents weren't musicians, right? No, uh, no, not professionally, but they both could sing and play yeah. instruments and did oh, okay. often and did and you know we, we would jam and stuff. But uh, and now maybe that's changing with um, the technology where you can, you know, get a V drum kit that sounds pretty amazing and can be pretty quiet, you know, about that's as quiet crazy. as a a keyboard and with your headphones on. So maybe that's changing. We'll see. Right. Uh, Do you have any elect? You have electronic kits. Yeah. You, you, the technology is pretty inc- has come along incredibly. Yeah. yeah. There was an, there was one, like one of those Tama electronic kits in my mm-hmm. house in the eighties. Mm-hmm. You know. Doo! Yeah. And um, I could never get excited about it because we weren't pumping the drums through a PA. So. I gotcha. Those drums would come yeah. through the PA, and all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, but now with the mesh heads and the all of the stuff, like consumer yeah. grade drums are, yeah, it makes yeah, sense it's, a lot it, easier. It's pretty awesome. I um, I've never really used them in that way, um, because in that case, which is great, but what they're trying to do is simulate a live drum kit, right? That's with the sensitivity and being able to play buzz rolls on a mesh head and stuff. Uh, I've got drums and I've got a studio right? and, and I don't have to. I, and when I was living in Manhattan, I had a separate studio with some roommates where we could blast at any, any time of day, 24 um, seven. So my overall use, like the first time I remember hearing purple rain and realizing that wasn't all a live drummer. And then uh, a bunch of other records like boys of summer. And I'm like, Oh wait, Oh wait, that's the same that's the same sound. Oh, that's a Lindrum. Okay, I'm going to buy a Lindrum. And then I started putting triggers on some of my drums, and I had a hybrid kit with samplers, and but a live kit. That's back in the so late 80s. You were 80s. triggering Lindrum sounds with... <laughs> no, I'd never triggered my Lindrum. I had the Lindrum, and I actually had it MIDI, which was like, oh, my God, how did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and after that, I, I got into Akai samplers, and I had a, a bunch of S nine hundreds because there was memory was there wasn't a lot of memory in them, and I started using them live. And when I started playing with Steve Morse, I would trigger some textural things to kind of fill out the trio sound and things like that. But basically, I started here, and I liked a lot of programmed records that weren't live drummers. You know, I also love live drummers, of course. And, to me, Isn't it was that... just a, it was just another musical expression, and I know a lot of drummers at the time were like, "Oh shit, I'm going to lose my job." I'm like, "Well, I don't know," but I, I program a lot for people too, you know. So, so anyway, how how much do you think <laughs> that these Lindrum and other, you know, pop and uh, R and B and hip hop drum sa- like program drums affected? your style um yeah i guess i never really thought of that um but i love the idea of someone who has a rhythm in their mind and they're not a drummer that's done all this training of okay what can i pull off physically here they just come up with the idea and um when i was at university of miami i (laughs) I was I was really into miles and all kinds of music and funk and rock and roll and soul, but uh, I played with this local band down there, uh, and they gave me the uh, the time record. What time is it? Oh, yeah. And there's a song on there called Seven 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 Ninety Three Eleven. Yeah. And it was really early in the drum machine world, so a lot of people thought, "Who is that drummer? And how how the hell does he play that?" And and then I've grown to find out that's actually Prince on a Lindrum, <laughs> like right. Prince programmed the whole thing, but we actually learned how to play it. And then, uh, but it was really difficult to play. But 
anyway, I just on an artistic musical level, I think it's more options is it's just for the sake of music and the spirit of music. I I love the, all those possibilities, you know. Technology, yeah. Back then, it was like the it was the dawn of that technology. Right now, the information in one of those Lindrums you could probably hold in a in an app on your iPhone, which is insane to me. Yeah, yeah. I've got a uh, pretty much every drum machine in the world in here. Wow, is <laughs> um, that right? Yeah, every sample of every drum machine and uh, yeah. So <laughs> the other, the thing, one of the things that blew my mind when I started learning about the Lindrum is that so many hits were, they were stock programs, <laughs> those drum beats, they were stock programs on, on, in well, the machine. It came. Well, it didn't, I'm not aware of it coming with anything from, as far as I know, you had to, you, I mean, the first Lindrum, it's black with the orange on it. There and were, then, and there were lens that came out after that. They weren't as successful, but the, um, as far as I knew, you had to program everything. But the stock things were the sounds, like you saw. It was a, a little, um, I don't know what they're called, but they call it a chip at the time, and that would be your snare right. sound. It's one sound, and you could tune each sound on on the kit, but you right. couldn't. To, in order to change the snare sound, you had to buy a new chip and then get your screwdriver out and take the screws out, open the front and replace it. So I remember here in seven, 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 93, 11, and that was the new hi-hat chip that had just come out. <laughs> <laughs> and then people would tune it different, but he has so many records like rebel yell and like across the board. And, uh, anyway, uh, so let's go, let's back up a little way. Sure. You said when you were getting heavy into playing, you would sort of become a bit of a stoner kid, like a Hesher, and you hey, were I like, can... I don't know if I want to be in the marching band. It's not all that cool. What were you? What were you playing? What were you? Were you in a band in high school? What yeah, was your, I ended up. What was your I, activity? I grew up in a really small town, and there weren't that many musicians. There was one guy who lived in the town, and in the same day, I was 11 years old, I think. He played me uh, um, Miles Davis' Kind of Blue <laughs> and Jimi Hendrix Band of Gypsies. Uh, maybe not Hendrix's most famous record, but to me, it's they're both, both those records are still like my Bibles, you know, <laughs> right. they've, they've paved the way for me. Not when I reflect back and different things that have happened and the, and, and for some reason, I, I, they both really hit home with me and not cause I thought they were cool. Like I got goosebumps, you know, when I, especially with, well, both records. Um, <clears throat> but there was a town a little bit bigger than Glen Ridge, New Jersey, which was Montclair. And I ended up getting introduced to some guys that were like two or three years older than me. And they were really into, um, my vision orchestra and, um, uh, miles and electric miles and, uh, weather report and Pat Metheny, his early records. And they were covering a lot of these songs. I don't know if you're into uh, Tony Williams, like time, believe it. That's like another big record for me. And these they are... were, co they were covering some of those songs. <laughs> These are young teenagers. They were like, uh, at that time, maybe it's a couple years later for me. So I was probably 13 and they were like 16. Or, and, wow. and and they could play those songs and, and I couldn't believe it. So I ended up in a band with them. And and then I started to get called to do like some gigs. It'd be like a party at someone's house. And then I got hired to do a bar mitzvah. Then I was making a little bit of money. And that's when I decided like, oh, hmm. I'm the youngest one here by like 20 years. Like maybe this is something I'm, you know, a little bit better at, but that's uh, musically, I guess I was kind of all over the map to answer right. your question. And, um, but I wasn't interested in marching. It just didn't, I, I actually didn't judge it at all for anyone that was doing it. I just, uh, I didn't want to spend my time doing that. So you went to Miami and studied music. 
University of Miami, yeah, studied music there for three years and then um, transferred to a small state school in New Jersey, William Patterson University, uh, uh, basically so I could start, I, I, I felt in my soul that I, I needed to get to New York City. I had been going and seeing countless concerts in Manhattan all the way through high school and and then earlier than that too with my father and and New York was really booming, you know. And so I used my last year of school as a free place to live <laughs> and was, you know, hustling work in New York, basically. So your time in Miami, did you get immersed at all into club music or Cuban music? Not really, um, which is I never um, like the really authentic, like Afro Cuban music. I. I love it. I have so much respect for it. I listen to it. I don't feel like that's a strength for me. Like I, the only people that I know that really own it, it's like in their blood, you know? Right. Uh, I'm not saying gringos can't play it, <laughs> but this gringo, <laughs> you know, if somebody calls me to do a gig, like I, I want to contribute in a way where we all win, you know? And if right. I'm not going to, if I'm not going to really shine that I, I would, offer it to one of the other 30 or 40 amazing Cuban drummers in Miami at the time, you know, but right, I also, you, you, no one wants to get on stage and know that there's five people in the audience that could smoke them. Yeah. It's just, see, I mean, like, like soul music, funk, hip hop, and this stuff is like my living room to me. It's like my absolute comfort zone and, and blues and everything that's grown out of that. But a lot of that other stuff, I, I was exposed to it in a beautiful way, but um, I didn't feel like um, that's something that I should, you know, yeah. I was more into playing jazz and, and rock and stuff like that. But oddly enough, I'm like drummer and uh, musical director for Enrique Iglesias, but that's not like my drumming. Uh, it's not salsa, you know, right. it's more it's more poppy and the other elements of the music, you know, reggaeton's become a part of that now. And uh we have an amazing Brazilian percussionist and nylon string guitars that, that give the flavor of right. the Latin thing. You know what I mean? So for me, it's more of a, just more of a pop groove thing, you know? So you, you leave university of Miami, you get up to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Are you playing it? Are you gigging on the weekends throughout this time? Or are you immersed in studies too much for that? Miami was incredible for me. It was absolutely incredible. The, the school, just being around those kind of students, uh, the staff, the teachers were, were great. Uh, I learned the, the most probably from the students, though, because there were some students that were just and still are <laughs> amazing. And I'm still close with many and many of them. Uh, but I was working like five nights a week. So I'd wow. be... And it just started happening, like my first semester there. And and it just went on that way all three years. One summer I stayed down there just because I was like, well, I don't, I don't have any work up in New York because, you know, I've kind of lived down in Miami now. So uh, so I stayed down in Miami and just kept, kept on doing stuff and sessions at Criteria Studios and different things like that. So, uh, but I felt at a certain point that I, I really, like New York was – what I had my eye on from the beginning and uh, musically was more where my heart was, you know, at the time. Now it's all, it's, it's all changed, you know, like Miami's more, way much more of a worldly city right. and um, the music scene, not what it was in New York. That's changed a lot. Um, but um, anyway, at the time, that's what I decided to do. And then I was moved up to New Jersey and I, could just any gig I could get, but I was loading, loading trucks for UPS for a little while. And That's was, a brutal job, man. I, I was digging deep. Yeah. When, <laughs> so I was, but you know, I moved up from there. How, and here, old, how like, old are you? No, You're 22, uh, 21, 21, I guess. And then taking tons of credits trying to finish school. Cause I really wanted to get out of school. I, uh, I love school, but I was like, if, if, if I do what I end up wanting to do, like my degree doesn't mean a whole lot, but you know, I want to finish what I started and sort of 
it sure. meant a lot to my my uh, my parents, you know, that I would finish. So, I, I, of course, I'm going to finish. And um, but yeah, those were those were <laughs> soul searching years. Yeah. Were, I, were your parents concerned about you wanting to pursue music as a career? They never. They, uh, they were always just really supportive. Maybe they were concerned, but they <laughs> they were probably like, hmm, well, at least doesn't seem to be very good at anything else. <laughs> it's not, the <laughs> Don't tell them I said saying, that, though. Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, no, they were just 100% supportive, you know. And, uh, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. When you finish school, um, at, kudos to you for taking that UPS gig. I had a gig like that in 2020 when the recession hit. And it was brutal, but I, you know, I was 48. My shift was like roughly three in the morning to eight in the morning. Gnarly. And I was going to, you know, taking 21 credits of school and I was playing in a cover band that was playing like only divorcee clubs, which might be interesting to some people at, at my age now, but back then, right. <laughs> that's, not, that's not where I wanted to, <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> So were there were there occasions? I would imagine there were occasions where you would do a gig, load up, and go to work. Yeah, I, I, every day, Oof. almost every day. Yeah, I, I, I would sleep an hour here, two hours there, and I did that for uh, maybe four months, and then I just I caved on the UPS thing. But I was starting to make money uh, with these other things. But I, uh, yeah. So. A lot of your first gigs, like your bread and butter gigs, were sort of utilitarian club gigs. They were, yeah. And then I got in a wedding. I got in a thing. wedding band that was like pretty high paying gig, and I actually had a lot of fun. I, you know, I didn't look at that like a long term thing, but uh, but I'm still friends with <laughs> a lot of the people from that band, and sure. uh, and weddings are. Uh, I, I haven't done a wedding in quite some time, but they're really difficult to really be able to play all those genres. Right. And so, um, I, I think a lot of musicians maybe don't realize that if they haven't <laughs> done a wedding, but, but to really play rock, really play rap, really play, uh, you know, right. Tarantella what year is and, and a rumba and a cha-cha and, and swing and play brushes and really, make it feel and sound authentic. That's, I don't know a whole lot of people that can do it. I do know some, you know, that do it great, but. Cause so every that was, wedding, uh, every wedding you're playing September, you're playing baby got back. You're playing, uh, I will survive. Right. Yeah. You're playing, uh, yeah. Every, I, I, every celebrate. Yeah. I don't know what it is now. I'm sure there's a whole nother list of things, but I do remember, playing a huge bar miss for like one of the last ones I did. And like, we started playing like, uh, some rap stuff and the older folks got really pissed off cause they were paying for it. <laughs> right. So then we started playing Sinatra. Then the kids came up and were really upset. We were playing Sinatra. You know, it's pretty funny. What's the, well, yeah. What's the happy middle ground in, uh, with that audience? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's... so that is, um, being in that circuit and having a gig like that is pretty cake. Like you, those are usually pretty good paying gigs and a lot of players don't aspire to change once they have a gig like that oh. because you can usually sleep in your own bed every night or mm -hmm. it's a weekend fly out. What, what was it that sort of got you going and, and becoming a touring guy i well the whole the whole reason i moved to new york was um again like i i had fun playing in that wedding band i but when i moved but when i went to william patterson i gave myself three years because right after that then i got an apartment in new york and i was like if i still have to play weddings um to pay my bills then I, i'm gonna change careers you know i'll go to law school or something and um, by that time I realized I was pretty good at, at the business of music. Cause that's the reason I'm still doing it, you know, <laughs> and, um, 
Um, so, yeah, I, I was crystal clear about that as well. Like, there's a, the wedding thing was a shelf life. I don't judge it, but I was like, it's a stepping stone to get to where I want to go <clears throat> and pay my rent. And no. uh, and if in three years I'm still, you know, financially have to do that, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna bail. And then I slowly, but you know, I started getting asked to do sessions for people and then bigger sessions. And then I auditioned for blood, sweat and tears and I got that gig. And, um, and then I started getting busier with blood, sweat and tears. And, and then the sessions got busier and I remember getting too busy to play in the wedding band anymore. And I actually, uh, to get to this one show in Florida with blood, sweat and tears, I had to go straight from my wedding to the airport. So I had my tuxedo with me in a garment bag and I, uh, I ceremoniously grilled it on the grill at this outdoor cookout. It was a big outdoor <laughs> festival and they were cooking alligator meat and rattlesnake down there. And I was like, when you guys are done with the grill, can I grill my tuxedo? And, and the whole blood, sweat and tears band stood around and, and you know, clapped. And so, when I got called to do a wedding like a month after that, I'm like, I'd love to, but I don't have a tuxedo anymore. So, anyway. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was there immediately enough work at that point or or did it get a little yeah. lean? No, no, I was I was busy. I mean, I, I didn't have the uh, financial obligations. Um, you know, I wasn't married. I, I didn't own real estate. I wasn't a father yet. And uh, right. But I was just those uh, were the days. Incredibly happy and inspired, and I, I still, I still act, am totally. <laughs> I have a lot more financial responsibilities, right. but I, you know, I chose them all. I'm not complaining about that either. But at the time, I was, you know, my overhead was relatively low, and um, I, you know, I, I realized that you know you could kind of, you could make a decent amount of money as long as you weren't buying into the whole starving artists mentality of oh you know whatever you can pay me for that record's fine you know i'll be like what's going on is like is sony behind this okay you, you know can we do how's this number would that work for you guys i don't care how many songs you know make right. a friendly conversation and then i and then i'd find out sometimes that you know i was making a little bit more than some other people and i was like oh well i wasn't playing hardball because right. i don't do business like that but um but yeah, no, I was, I was, um, it was great, you know. And if I still need to do the wedding band, I would have stuck it out longer. But. If you need a nickel, you don't ask for three cents, right? You ask for ten. <laughs> I don't know. I, I like to. I think people's. Uh, you can, if you know what you're bringing to the table, and and there's the other. Um, mentality of if someone has money and they they want to buy the you know there's a six hundred dollar pair of cowboy boots and then there's a used pair of you know twenty dollar cowboys but it's someone who has very high regard for themselves and they make money they're gonna get those boots <laughs> right and I'd it's the same by the twenty dollar boots no matter what well i still do that sometimes <laughs> too but my point about it you know um sometimes if you're asking for something that's way below what I would think someone deserves, um, they they sometimes the artists don't value that as much. Right. So anyway. So throughout this period of time, like, do you immediately start paying attention to the engineering of drum recording? Or is that something that you started to do with a four track in high school? I, I wish I would have, um, <laughs> woulda, shoulda, coulda. I, I tend not to live that way, but I, I wish I would have paid more attention to it early on. But eventually, um, eventually that started happening. And I was like living in other people's recording studios, like Steve Morse always had a place at his house. And I learned a lot from him. And then um, I was working a lot at a handful of the studios in New York and still do. And, and a lot of those engineers, some of the best engineers still in like in the world, as far as I'm concerned. So um, uh, I was with another band that that uh, needed a place, got a record label and needed a place to uh, 
to work on our music and store our stuff and the record label paid for that for a little while and and then that ended up turning into a little recording studio so some of my engineer mates who were you know all the time i've spent on the craft of drumming and programming and music you know they put all that energy into learning how to get sounds and mics and things being in and out of phase and mic pre's and compression blah 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 so i would hire them to get me set up and take painstaking notes and photos of everything and <clears throat> i still do that in here too from time to time but for the most part i'm engineering stuff myself <clears throat> it seems to me that drummers make really good producers and engineers do you would you agree generally speaking oh, I, I know i know a lot of them do you know and um and, I, and i've also along those lines i've seen drummers be musical directors which right. is unheard of as far as i could tell like 20 years ago right maybe i'm wrong <laughs> um, but don't you think that it's because i mean seems like maybe it's because drum everyone wishes they were the drummer let's just throw let's just get that out there everyone <laughs> on stage wishes they were the drummer but that they could also be in the front of the stage secretly oh. everyone wants to be a drummer in the front of the stage gotcha uh, then you're i'm happy like being in the back like I, I i don't need the uh i don't need the fanfare but um that's because you're the drummer <laughs> you're driving you're driving the ship yeah, I've never really looked into that, but I noticed uh, a lot of the musicians that I've either played with or just admired or both, uh, like Steve Morris and Eddie Van Halen, and they used to play drums, you know? They have a history of playing drums, and I'm like, oh, that's why your feel is so incredible, you know? So I don't know if that's the case with every musician, but... Um, I didn't know that Steve Morris played drums. Yeah, he did before uh, when he was really young, and then his brother took over, and he, you know, got the guitar. But uh, yeah, but he has a very strong sense of time. Right. Yeah. Uh, but drummers generally are listening to everything to con you know to construct their part, probably more so than than anyone else. That's sort of like banging out on the on the foundation of a song. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also the hardest instrument to record harder than vocals. Yeah. I've never recorded an orchestra, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you don't need a, a studio unless you're, you're a drummer. And, uh, so, right. you know, with the studio, I've got stereo room mics in here. I've got stereo ribbon mics in the room adjacent to it, which is a tiled room. And that's a big part of what people are looking for when they get tracks from me, you know, if we're working remotely or we're working here. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Hey buddy. Hey, coming in. Come so, on, um, friend. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but <laughs> everyone else I know, you know, any other instrument that they're fine, you know, just right. a couple of good mics and some good mic pre's and or I mean or not I have a, or, an aux and I just I can crank an amp into that thing and run it right into uh, my interface and it's mm -hmm. no I can record full volume mm -hmm. gotcha. track it and my wife could be sleeping in the next room it's crazy uh, yeah coming up no uh. he'll let you know <laughs> <laughs> So what is the first, oh, you were the Blood, Sweat, and Tears. That yeah, that was the on... first, like, uh, you know, it was my gig, and we were starting to get, you know, some B endorsements. I mean, like, not not full endorsements, but uh, those relationships started happening. How did I that play... feel? Uh, for me, um, it's an incredible band. David Clayton Thomas was singing, unbelievable singer. And it was the first time, <laughs> I mean, I, I still feel fortunate for all the other gigs I, I had, like smaller ones in restaurants or whatever, you know, but a lot of the time it'd be like, hey, can you guys keep it down, you know? And that was the first time where I, uh, that, where I heard, uh, you know, they would announce that band as, uh, you know, the heart and soul of New York City, Blood, Sweat and Tears. And I heard the crowd that, you know, 
thousands of people. And I was like, oh, man, that's like, it's like flying first class. There's no adjustment time, right? It's just like, right. yeah, that's going to work, you know? And, um, and I was also, you know, the band was just killer. And was so your I was first show also with really, really proud to be part of it because it really sounded like, really, like this, this music's powerful, you know? And, was um, your first show with the band your biggest show? Well, the first one I actually subbed for somebody, and it was one of it was I played a handful that were like more than two hundred thousand, but that was the first one. It was like two hundred and twenty-five thousand. It was a Fourth of July music festival down in uh, North Carolina, and two hundred and twenty thousand. Yeah, it was, there were a bunch of bands. It was like Hall and Oates, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and I, I don't remember and. Uh, probably because I was nervous as hell. And I, uh, uh, David Clayton Thomas came up to me and said, uh, no rehearsals, you know? <laughs> and he said, uh, yeah, we're a rock band. I don't want you reading charts on stage. And I get that. And I also agree with that philosophy. I don't like music stands covering people up, but sure. there are some songs like uh, When I Die, where it changes, uh, you know, doom, da, da, doom. Doom, da, da, doom, da, 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 changes like the tempo and the time. And, and there's no way I could uh, remember a whole show without train wrecking. So I. Uh, Were there the drum... any audibles in the set? I mean, you had a set list and. I had a set list and, and I ended up, uh, I went to the drum tech. I went, I need you to duct tape all the charts to the drum riser on the ground. Yeah. And, and he's like, Would, I heard him say he didn't want you reading music. He's like, he won't know. Just do that. Like, no yeah. music stand. And, and I made it through. And the next show after that, I think, was Madison Square Garden. It's crazy. So, And that was your first time playing the garden? Yes. As a and guy I'm, who moved to New York to, to do it, that must have been the greatest feeling up to it was, that point in your life. It was incredible, yeah. yeah. And they were, you know, that was a multi-band thing, too, from that era of time. You know, like, Blood, Sweat, and Tears isn't going to sell that place out. But, um, and, I, you know, I've been fortunate to play there many times since and sure. did it last October, actually. <laughs> so. But the first time must have been pretty sweet. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Were your but folks it's still, still around? But it's still, I still feel incredibly grateful when it happens every time, you know, still. Like, it still almost feels like the first time every time, you know. Were your folks still around to see you play there the first time? Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, they were there, a bunch of, bunch of friends of mine from high school, and uh, yeah, it was special. Awesome. And uh, and I was proud of the band, too. That was a big part of it, you know. If, if, if we were like a a C grade level version of blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> it wouldn't have been as sweet, but right. uh, super, super proud of my uh, one year with that band. Cause I, I only did it for a year until I got the, I auditioned for Steve Morris and got that. And that kind of changed, pulled me in another direction. How did that come to be? Um, I was in a band that was popular in New Brunswick, New Jersey, that was called Stretch. And it, um, Dave LaRue is the bass player, and Glenn Alexander is a guitar player. And uh, Steve uh, already had a musical relationship with Dave LaRue, the bass player. And uh, Steve was looking for a new drummer. Rod Morgenstein had just gotten busy with Winger. And um, so the three of us got together in a club called the Birchmere, kind of a legendary Jersey club back in the early Bon Jovi days and Skid Row days. And uh, he was on tour with Kansas and he just popped in and we played a handful of uh, his more difficult songs and that was it. <laughs> so No rehearsal, you did We ended up did rehearsing. We, did, we, we ended up rehearsing down on his farm uh, outside of Atlanta after yeah. that. Um. <clears throat> But he wasn't big on rehearsing. Like he uh, 
he is big on the show being great, but there were some songs that we didn't even hit once. You know, I think he just felt like we were ready. And, uh, and I was, I was sweating bullets the first couple shows. So How... because he had, ne he had never really played with another drummer for any length of time. And, um, here's this new guy from New Jersey. I don't, I love Rod Murray's scene, very close friend, incredible drummer. I have completely different influences than Rod. So for me to even try to do Rod <laughs> would be a dishonor to him. But, uh, I just had to have trust that Steve was like, you know, he knew what he was getting into with me. You know, so. <laughs> anyway. How do you, how do you approach that, the, the pressure of walking on stage without a rehearsal? Cause I imagine that's happened a handful we did, of times. For we, you. we did, we did rehearse, but not, not uh, every song, you know, and, uh, like I wanted to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse because, you know, um, but those guys, I mean, I had such a great chemistry with Dave LaRue and that was a big part of what, like Steve could feel that he goes, oh, this is already a band in itself. And so, uh, but yeah, I do a lot of those. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, if someone asked me to do their gig, like I, I, I take it seriously because I'm gonna I'm gonna learn every song like, <laughs> and I'm not gonna half-ass it. I just don't, you know. That's not one of the reasons I'm on this earth, you know. So, I, but so when I think when I when I accept it before I accept it, I think about it because I realize it's gonna take it's gonna take time, you know. Sure. And I and if I can't put the time in, I'll, I'll say no just because I don't have time to learn twenty songs. <laughs> So, uh, and walking on stage and trying to play songs that are not that you're not at a totally unconscious place is really difficult. Yeah, it takes a while for things to gel. It usually doesn't happen right away on the first thing, unless it's like uh, I've had great experiences with. Um, I used to play with Joan Osborne a lot before she really blew up. And, and she would do a lot of blues covers and things like that. And I remember playing with her with no rehearsal. And I was like, this is fucking great right now. Like whatever's happening is like levitating. <laughs> and we never right. rehearsed. But with that's not Steve. That's not the story with Steve Morse's music or Kansas or other bands that I've played with. So what's the most harrowing uh, moment you've had on stage where you're like, I don't know what's gonna. Ha I don't know what's happening. Um, early in my years in New York, uh, there was a drummer who did a lot of Broadway work, and he wanted to do more of the work that I was doing, like records and gigs. And so he goes, "Why don't we do work out a barter situation so you can sub for me on the Radio City Christmas Spectacular? You know, the famous show that happens." Sure. for i don't know how long now and um and i was like well you know maybe that's something i should check out just because i just moved to new york and maybe that's something that'll be you know one of my one of my gigs is that kind of thing so um he gave me the music and i did my homework like i normally do like i always do and uh but he, he also, I think he was looking after his turf, so he didn't give me all the music. I found out <laughs> while I was on while I was on stage. So anyway, I'm in the pit, you know, and, and the stage is up behind you. And um, but I feel confident because I did my homework and the, I can see the charts. The conductor's right there. It's to a click track. But all of a sudden. I didn't realize that we were on an electric stage and the stage all of a sudden raises up like 20 feet. And now, like, I'm trying to concentrate on the chart and the conductor, but like my bass drum is like two feet from the person in the front row. This, <laughs> you know, like Ann Edna from Ohio, like holding her right. purse. And uh, so that's distracting me. Then it goes up even further, rolls backwards onto the main stage, all the way to the back of the stage, goes up 30 feet in the air. And now we're playing like a Count Basie swing song. He didn't tell me any of this stuff. 
then it comes back down and the rockets are kicking right in front of my, you know, the whole chorus line, kicking in front of my drum set. And I'm still like sight reading like a song I've never seen before. So that was probably the hairiest. So he gave you all the music, but not all the details of the show. N no, he left out two songs. <laughs> how, how did that go? I, I didn't train wreck it, but it was hairy. And, and I realized, oh, I, I know what's going on here. You know, he, you know, he's looking after his job. So that was probably the hairiest thing that I've ever been through. So what kind of, uh, what kind of words did you have for him after that? No, nah, I, <laughs> I, I know things that are better than words. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> How did you, how did you feel after that experience? That's crazy. I actually felt like um, that at that point in my life that I, I even before the show started, they were, that it's not something. But like I wanted to keep her just stay focused on what I was doing, you know, yeah. which was um, uh, developing music for new artists and and playing on records and touring with people and. Um, putting bands together and uh, I have done some Broadway things here and there I, I just subbed recently on a show and you know that was fun um, I'm still pretty uh, I have an obligation uh, to Enrique Iglesias so it's a little bit hard for me to like I could technically do a show but the timing would have to work right around that schedule right for the time being so anyway <laughs> <laughs> I, how many nights did you do? Did you just do one night? I just did one night, and they didn't. I was supposed to do two nights, and the conductor was like, "No, he's not coming back." And I'm like, "Well, I, you know, yeah." I, what are you I, I decided do? I decided not to say anything about it, about what the real deal was. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, that's but, um, that's pretty harsh, though. That's it. That's yeah, a bit of vicious. smelling salts. That's vicious. That's not the way I roll. Like that's I, I moved. I'm I, I guess I'm subconsciously competitive in, in a way, but I'm more I, I moved to New York to be inspired and 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 to learn and, and be moved by the best talent in the world, including the drummers, you know, and uh, and that, that's really the way I look at it. You know, I, I, um, I maybe I'm I'm competitive and um what's the difference between but but, but I, I would never I would never do something like that like I, I get subs for a lot of like blood sweat and tears I would get subs I I haven't gotten subs for Enrique in a while but I want the best person that can possibly you know I want the artist that's been really loyal to me like sure I, I'm not going to shortchange him so they all look better and send a Right. A below average drummer or somebody that's not going to do his homework. So, right. Yeah. Uh, so what happens after this? What kind of gigs are you getting at this point? What, and also in the timeline, what is this? Is this the mid uh, you're on in years? So it's at least. What, what are we talking about now? Uh, well, so... well, after, after your Broadway gig, you're, 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 you're flamed oh. out. Uh, yeah, that was the old, that, yeah, that was, uh, I had, uh, yeah, I had headphones for the click. Is that what you meant? Yeah. the click on the show. Uh, that was probably 88. Oh, wow. Okay. Seven or something. I was still playing with blood, sweat and tears. Yeah. And so, and Morris was 89. That's when I started playing with him. And then I started recording records with him the next year after that. And at that point, you're pretty on. I mean, you must feel pretty great. It was it's exciting. I mean, um, I always had this funny thing because I always loved pop and big pop records, and I love Michael Jackson. I love Hall and Oates. I love. Yeah. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Uh, I also love. Jeff Beck and Steve Morris. The fact that like that I still get a call from Steve Morris every once in a while, I'm like, 
holy shit, like Steve Morse is fucking calling me, you know? And it's been 25 years, but I right. still, it's like mind blowing to me, you know? <laughs> but, um, but I got the Steve Morse gig and that's really what put my face on the map because I was in, you know, Modern Drummer and whatever else. And then, um, but then I feel like in, in some ways you're, some people don't always want to hire you because, oh, he's a fusion guy, you know? Right. And um, I, I quickly just grew to appreciate the challenge of it. And I, I think the thing that turned that around is I, I, I got called to, um, to do some of the drumming stuff at Naughty by Nature and, and, uh, and those, nobody knew who those guys were. And then I, I did, uh, I played drums. It's like a measure long, a loop. And, and that, that was used for OPP and then a couple other songs. And then it's like, Oh, he's, he, he's associated with that rap record, but he plays with more. So I guess he can play pop or whatever. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of drumming involved with the Naughty by Nature thing, but I think that opened other doors um, where I wasn't just typecast as a like fusion drummer. So that record, the OP, the uh, Naughty by Nature record, was recorded in New York. And, <laughs> so if, no, my friend's parents' basement. Uh, I told you that divorcee cover band I played in when I was at William Patterson College. Yes. So the keyboard player in that band, we became fast friends and we were totally in sync musically. So we were working on other stuff and his name is Dave Bellocchio. And he, uh, he goes, Van, I'm thinking of building like an eight track studio in my parents' basement. What do you think? And, uh, I was like, Dave, I think it's probably one of the stupidest ideas I ever heard in my life, but you know, he was, way ahead of me <laughs> as far as thinking about writing and production and his career. Um, but anyway, Naughty by Nature, Queen Latifah, their careers all started in his parents' basement. And obviously it grew from an eight track and um, he's done a lot of great work um, with Hall and Oates and a lot, a lot of different people in film work. And that's crazy. Um, but he was the keyboard player in that cover band <laughs> that I was uh, before the wedding band, you know, and, uh, and we still do stuff together. He lives in L.A. now. He's got a beautiful studio in Studio City in his house. Um, but, um, yeah, that's so how that happened. So you and roll I got... into his parents' basement. And how, I mean, how long did you play until he was like, I can, I can make a loop out of that and, and we, can, we can do this? Well, first of all, it was just like a demo. Like we would typically do like 200 bucks for the day or something like that for any anyone you know uh or that would be my fee you know right and nobody knew tommy boy records or naughty by nature and uh i think we worked for two days so i got four four or five hundred bucks doesn't really matter right. and um um i mean the producer kg they were just incredibly creative guys and they you know they grew up they grew up uh, in the rough part of East Orange, New Jersey, and, and they just, nothing would hold them back. You know, they just figured out how to be creative and how they did. I already loved rap at that point, you know, so it wasn't, I wasn't one of those people that's like, oh, yeah, it's not music or anything. I'm like, like, no, no, no. I, I love this music, and it's just starting. It's exciting. But, uh they basically, they were trying not to pay for, pay for samples. So they were trying to have me play beats on different records. Right. And then I, again, I was really fluent with that, the Kai S 900. So that was part of it too. Um, they just wanted the loops. So that whole, that whole song and my contribution is one measure. <laughs> right. But, but, but all I, of a sudden, this is a huge hit. Yeah, I went and, on tour. This is before the internet. I went on tour for a month or something. Are you toured came... with them? No, not oh. no. I went on tour with uh I think it was Steve Morse right after that. Yeah, I might be getting my years a little mixed up, but I, I went on tour with Morse for a, a month or two and I came back and stopped by Dave's to have a beer and he threw the Rolling Stone magazine down in it and it was like 
look, look, it's just, it's it's taken off. OPP is like huge, and there's OPP swag, and they they mention our name in the article, and I was like, wow, that's crazy, you know. So um, he's like, I'm buying a 16 track. <laughs> yeah. I'm buying yeah. an ADAT. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, and I did some work on their second record. I don't think they used any of my stuff, uh, but, uh, you know, I still get residuals from three that's of the songs a, on that first record. That's so. incredible. So that song was unavoidable and you still hear it at basketball, at sporting events. You hear it's, yeah. you know, it's still everywhere. Mm hmm. How how do you feel when you hear it, and and how did you feel then, being a part of something that was much bigger than you? Um, no, I just felt great about it, you know. And you know, some people were like, "You should go after more money." I'm like, "No, I agreed." See, that's bad business right there. I I didn't say, "Okay, pay me this amount," but if it if you sell a few million, I want more. Right. So I don't want to go against my word. And, and then I ended up working on the second one and doing pretty well with that. A deal um, is a deal. It, for me, it is. And to no. go backwards on it, it's not cool, you know. So, um, no, it was. I'm happy about all of it. And I and I again, you know, there's still there's new licensing streaming laws now that uh, I forget what it's called when you perform on a song but have nothing to do with the composition but there's like intellectual rights or something like that um but i've gotten more uh not life-altering checks but substantially more than what i got paid um and during the pandemic too i was like yeah <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> yeah um so is that the beginning of more projects yeah, the whole time I, I couldn't even keep track of uh, how many things were going on. You know, it was pretty, pretty exciting. I, I would just, I just wanted to play with everyone to get my face in front of people, and uh, um, so sometimes I'd play two, three shows a night after having done like a TV commercial or two during the day, and maybe a, a one song on someone's record. I mean, that that would be an extreme day, but. Um, but New York was booming. It's before the downloading thing. And there were so many studios. Um, yeah, just, and, and mostly putting my drums in taxis, you know, I didn't want to have a car. Being a drummer in New York is a tough gig. It's rough. I, I wouldn't do it again right now. <laughs> <laughs> but now most of the places have drums, like all the studios have kits and, and, clubs the, most of the clubs have had drums now which is great but right when did it start i mean you said that it feels great every time you play the garden but a lot of times when you play now you're playing gigs at that level you're playing b big spaces how uh, yeah yeah, 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 pretty much. <laughs> how how do you sort of reckon with the normalization of that? Because clearly you are a humble enough, like, you know, it's not in your head. And you're talking about like, yeah, I had these wedding gigs and they're great. And I made money and it was a stepping stone. And probably if push came to shove, you would do weddings again because you could play drums and, and sustain yeah i wouldn't want to spend my time doing it. i like i would do it with the people that i was in that last wedding band with because i, I love them so much and they're really good and it would be uh it would be fun you know um um i, I don't know it's just i guess it's a gradual thing and it just feels natural and i still just i still just feel like um you know it's just what i do for a living you know <laughs> right and and i like to work really hard at stuff that i believe in and i i feel uh it's a, it's a gift and and to not treat it like it's a gift from somewhere is uh would be a disrespect to music in general and so um i think that's the re mainly reason is you know being willing to work harder and 
put up with the bullshit in New York those earlier years. And, uh, I'm in a different place now. <laughs> right. I, I have a lot of space here and I got a lot of toys and uh, I want my kids out of space. So my priorities have, have changed. But Through, my work uh, ethic has not. Right. Uh, even though you're sort of normalized to performing on stages at that level, have you had any moments in recent history in the last 10 years where you have been overwhelmed by like, holy shit, look, look at what's happening or it, it, been emotional it, oh. by moved in a way that yeah. sort of caught you off guard? Yeah, I, I mostly feel that way when I when I perform, you know, it still feels like, holy shit, you know, always <laughs> and Pretty much, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm. It's just grateful for another chance to, to do it, and having, um, I guess the main gigs for me the last years is you know Rick has been big. I started with him in '01, and then around 2010, he asked me to take over as the band leader slash MD, and you know share some of those responsibilities. Um, as well um but also during that time uh nana uh 99 love balloons her yeah, i saw her i saw her career go from you know she took time off to be a mother and got back involved with the music business and somehow i got asked to play drums on a tour then asked to be the md and then i watched I was recording records with her and hiring people for her and i watched her become huge again like arenas again and she's still there. <laughs> so I, I can I don't remember know. the very first time it's... I heard 99 Love Balloons as a kid. When Excuse it was me? Her... I can remember yeah, the very first time I heard that song and being. Yeah, that's in, one of those like... songs. I remember where I was standing when I heard it, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a incre <laughs> yeah, incredible song. Mm -hmm. So, uh but then now she's gotten up to that level and Enrique's always been at that level. And um and she would let me sub out. So I've had a lot of amazing drummers uh <laughs> sub for me. Like it's ridiculous. Like Frank Ferrer from Guns N' Roses, Zach Alford and Sterling Campbell from Bowie and everybody yeah. else. Near Z is a huge uh Nashville guy now. And um anyway, um I guess also something that makes it feel uh, it's always a mind blowing experience. But in both those cases, with those two artists, which were doing arenas all at the same time, um, I was part of the part of the process of building the the band that supported the artists. So it there's a lot of love there. So that actually makes it even. You know, we're up there like freaking about it together, you know, like, so that's something that's, right. it, it's a comfort to me because it's people I'm familiar with. And, you know, I, it's consistently, they know how to play and we know how to relate to each other. But to me, that helps a lot um, is sharing it. It, it actually uh, enhances the whole experience for me when you love the people you're working with, you know. There's something about an arena that I think is it sounds kind of ridiculous to say but more intimate than a festival or an outdoor crowd and it definitely touches when i am have the opportunity to do those gigs touches me differently like i have a completely different experience because looking out from stage it looks like the inside cover of Kiss Alive 2 or any other <laughs> number, any other yeah. number of gatefold records that you would see yeah. like that, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, very few festival crowd photos. They're just it kicks in that sort of emotional memory. So, yeah. yeah. Do you remember yeah. the first time you played in an arena? It's probably that probably the garden blood sweat and tears wow yeah yeah so i think that was the actual photo from kiss alive too was the garden maybe 
<laughs> I, I mean, the, so. the, the the photos in the dressing room area are mind blowing too. Like, just they got a lot of history up on the walls in the dressing room. You know, from the stones that you know all the years there. And uh, anyway, a lot of a lot of acts and 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 Rick is actually one of them. <laughs> it's on the walls right. now. But um, another thing that was really mind blowing to me after taking two unwanted years off of touring due to the pandemic was the first show we played in Vegas. And, and that was, you know, I was having a whole time holding it together. The first, first couple songs. And it wasn't just, um, <clears throat> the whole band, we were in contact a lot through zoom and stuff and talking. And of course we miss it, but also realizing that the, the people, yeah. The crowd missed it, and it just happening at the same time was pretty, pretty special, you know. Oh. During that time off, how busy were you able to keep yourself in the studio? A lot of people made records. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've been working remotely for quite a while, and uh, it just more of that started happening. At the beginning, I, um, I kind of took a step back because. Um, I realized uh, I've been so fortunate to uh, to be able to um, for the, my opportunities in the music world that I never said no to a great opportunity. So I was really running for like 25 years with not a whole lot of time off, and I became a father in that time. So um, being able to slow down and just Go, you know, I'm going to take a minute here and and wake up with my kids every day and dial into them. And um, I've always been really close with both of my kids, but it was something special to to really slow down for a second and just contemplate and try to. Um, I mean, financially, I could do that for for a period of time, and um, and then it started getting busier. You know, after six months into it, and. Uh, right. uh, so, and now it's pretty, pretty consistently busy here, but also, I'm also, you know, still doing other, other things as well in other studios. And so. How do you, when you do go on an, on an extended tour, are you guys touring this summer? Not a lot. Well, we're about to go uh, in June. We're going to Prague and Poland, pretty close to the Ukraine border and um, Budapest. Um, but Enrique is finishing up a record and we have some other dates in September and scattered things, but not, uh, I was planning on doing a world tour in 2023, um, pretty much, pretty much everywhere. So that's going to be a much busier year. So it's cool. It gives me the opportunity to get involved with other stuff, you know? How do you think? after you've had this couple of years that things have slowed down and you've been able to like engage with your kids more than before touring is probably going to feel a little bit different. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, really, <laughs> I got to the point where I, I love being home, <laughs> but I also, yeah, I mean, that, that's part of, part of what I am and what I do, the touring thing. Um, so, you know, How old are I'm going to, I'm I, uh, 22, my daughter's 22 and my son's 17. So he's a, he's a junior in high school and got she's, it. she's got her own place in, uh, in Brooklyn, actually. They're pretty independent at this point. Yeah. My son just got his driver's license. So that's pretty much. <laughs> Is he loading drums into him, into his car? No, no, he's not. Uh, but just the freedom of being able to bust around, you know, and maybe I'll have him load my drums in the car. That <laughs> sounds like a good idea. So, um, have you, do you have concerns about traveling to Eastern Europe right now? Um, not the moment. If it's not safe, we won't go. Yeah. So it's six hours from the Ukrainian border. I mean, anything could happen between now and then, right? Sorry about what's going on there. Um, uh, we did have lots of dates in Russia, actually. 
Moscow, Sochi, St. Petersburg, you know. Right. Um, um, yeah, if it's not safe, we won't go. So, or we won't go to Poland. But I, right as of right now, it's f- fully on. How amazing. I, I, I assume you've been to every continent. Uh, pretty much. I have never been to China and... Um, but you've been to Asia. You've been to J- Japan. I've been to Japan, not with Enrique, but uh, with uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and Morse, and uh, Bernie Worrell from Parliament Funkadelic. Um, oh my God! And um, uh, but I haven't been in a while. <laughs> I miss it actually. Yeah. If you find if you have a change of heart and you find the time. I would love to do a Coutrous video of a Funkadelic song with you. <laughs> I, I love it so much. Yeah, I got great Bernie memories and stories. He was such a beautiful person to me, you know. He's just, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know I could be so c- close to somebody that was so much older than me, you know. But talk about humble, man. Just, you know. Such a, a, such a beautiful guy. Uh, a lot of fun. A lot of fun touring with him. What, what is you think the biggest less unexpected lesson you've learned from someone that you were playing drums with or for? Um. Well. I could think of one off the top with Bernie since we're on the topic of that. And he had, uh, um, <laughs> we were on this, we, we, we toured in Japan and then we were touring in Europe and the, the big gig was at the Paradiso in, in Amsterdam. Yeah. And all the shows in, in Europe were kind of leading up to that one. And, and, uh, he decided to stay up the night before, you know, and just partying on the bus and, I mean, everyone was partying. Uh, That's the town uh, to do it. <laughs> and I was like, um, you know, Bernie, got a big show tomorrow, man. Are you sure? You know, and here he's done like all this just incredible work with Pete Funk and everybody else and talking heads. And and uh, he didn't say anything like he, he probably should have just shut me up right away. But he didn't say anything, but he played the most incredible show at the Paradiso after not sleeping for like two days right. that I was just, it just, he didn't need to say anything, you know, he's like, man, this is what I do, bro. You know, like and I've been doing it a lot longer than you. And, right. uh, but you know, he was nice enough not to squ- squash me like a bug about it. So that, that was a big one, you know, where, uh, <laughs> somehow i felt like i was in a position where i could say that to bernie where you know just like dude check yourself <laughs> you know so now but now you're the a musical director I, I imagine uh you wouldn't be so out of place to say that to someone now i'll assume that still people... it's still his history you know it's sure. like sure it's I don't know, man. You it's know, it's not like he came from a straight edge band. <laughs> it's the kind of thing. It's like, you know, the people who ask you to be the band leader and musical director, they're the ones that give you the power to do it because they're in a position to do that. So, the Bernie actually referred to me as his lieutenant, but he basically, you know, he didn't need a musical director. He was a musical director. So, right. uh, but maybe that's why I felt a little responsible for it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I just, uh, the people that have, you know, Nana was the first real big artist to ask me to do that. And I, and I was like, wow, that's a huge honor, you know, especially because I don't speak German. <laughs> <laughs> and then she got huge again and had all these German superstars guesting on her shows. And, you know, I'm having to organize the music and speak to them in English, you know? Um, and then, you know, Enrique was, was after that and I, I think in both those cases they both wanted someone who was already in the band 
and I just I think they looked at me as maybe the best option within those nine people right there you know and uh but it all of it's like it's such a loose loosely it's so, such a loose term for me I, I don't look at it like it's a badge or anything like that it's just uh for the most part you know i'm involved with the creative process with enrique but i'm a hundred percent in charge of like hiring people or finding talent when we need it but I'll send my resume over. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you sing backgrounds? See. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, how? So some of the some of the most exciting moments on tour, because of course, touring is an hour and a half of yeah. you know bliss, doing what you came there to do, and twenty. Two and a half hours of monotony and yep. uh, travel and sitting, hurrying up and waiting, right? How yep. I spend a lot of time on tour walking around whatever town I'm in. Mm -hmm. It's always a drag if you're at a festival because you're out in the middle of a field somewhere. You can't walk anywhere, right? Gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How has has your role in these two bands affected your day-to-day -day on tour in a way that where you have more responsibilities and so you have less recreational time to enjoy towns? Um, I mean, initially the hard, the hard work is like finding the right people. And that, that takes, uh, it's to me, it's worth putting a lot more time and thought and, uh, open-mindedness in, into that part of it because i find when you have the right people it, then it starts to run itself you know uh i've learned the hard way to like well it's a great player i'm not sure he's the right person or she or whatever and usually if i'm asking myself that question they're not the right person you know right. um which means i haven't i haven't done my uh my due diligence with it so uh, gratefully, the people I work with are forgiving, and they, you know, I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, that wasn't the best call. So I'm gonna learn, learn from that. And um, um, but once the show's up and running, it doesn't. It's not too much extra work, you know. But a lot of the one-offs that we're doing this year, that's that's a bit of work, just because right. it's uh, they're big production shows, but we're still like using um like my main drum kit it'll be a gretsch kit but it, it won't be my gretsch kit with my curve bars and stuff it, it'll be a, a rental and so right. my text my text got to put my rolling stuff around it my that i'm triggering from uh and uh and that'll be the case too with the percussionist and you know the keyboard players got different controllers he's mostly using main stage from his laptop but um, that's a little more time consuming. But like a routed U.S. tour, like after the after we after the set list is really like we can't make it any better. And I don't know your experience, but for for me, it's like then it then it's kind of runs itself, you know. So, what does your day to day look like when you are traveling in America or in Europe or anywhere? Really, are you a, uh, a early early riser? Um, when I'm home, I am. I, 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 um, I go to bed like planning when I'm going to exercise the next day. That's kind of where it starts. And then, you know, knowing how much work I have and when, when the workout's going to come in, because that's a big part of my personal, uh, um, my, keeps my physical and mental thing, uh, um, on 10, you know, when, when I'm there. And if I don't do it and get lazy with it, I, I'm not on 10. And, and then back to your whole thing about traveling for 22 hours and playing for an hour and a half. If I'm not on 10 for that hour and a half, I'm like really <laughs> upset with myself. Like, right. so you spent that whole time and you're not, you know, you're not ready to kill it for that 90 minutes, two hours, you know? So is that something um, you adopted early on, or was that something that you picked up later? I think it happened in my young, really young thirties, maybe late, 
you know, 28, 29, 30. Um, and I, I've always been a, a runner. And then I, then I eventually I got into triathlons and all that crazy stuff. Um, that's an amazing uh, way to see every town. Running is really an amazing way to see every town. Yeah. Yeah. It is. But as I'm getting older, I, you know, I know I can't run. I can't just go and go and go like I used to. <laughs> so you've been to a lot of the cities uh, over the years of touring. Do you have do you have different running routes that you have like you look forward to when you're when you look at your tour book and you're like, all right, <laughs> killer, I'm going to I'll go do. This yeah. Yeah. I, re I remember some of them. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And uh, I used to tour a lot with um, Richard Fortas from Guns N' Roses. He used to also be in Enrique's band for a little while. And then he was in Nana's band for a little while. Yeah, and and, and uh, he's, you know, I don't, actually don't know what his running chops are now, but he was like top 2% in the New York City Marathon for a while. But Is that right? Did, but didn't tell me that, like the first time we ran in Singapore, <laughs> So here I'm thinking like, this guy's not going to keep up with me. And I, I was dying, you know, I could, I couldn't get him, you know, and uh, gave me something to work towards. But oh, we thought amazing. of, we thought about creating an app for runners. I'm sure it exists now, but uh, just cause we had been on so many cool runs together, but it's been a while since I've had like a, you know, running, running touring partner. Right. Um, but, but yeah, that's one of my, one of my favorite things, you know? So run oh, and then I'll, then I'll work out somewhere. So, did you stay running throughout the pandemic time? You get up and go run. Yeah, and I've got uh, tennis courts here too that are communal tennis courts, but no one uses them. It's on the other side of my laptop right here. <laughs> so I had, uh, um, yeah, a handful of really close friends that we knew and trusted and regarding the, you know covid and all that stuff so we would we would play in the middle of the day that was during that first six month period where i was like right no i'm gonna spend time with my kids i'm gonna exercise i'm gonna play tennis and but before i play tennis like uh you know three times a year i was too busy you know so has your anyway. tennis game picked up yeah, yeah it's yeah. good nice it's good um Tell me about the studio. How long? How long you've been set up there? And mm -hmm. uh, and also, if people want to get in touch and have you do programming or perform, mm -hmm. uh, you know, play drums on a recording or a record, how they can get in touch with you? Yeah, I refer to it on my Instagram and Facebook as uh, LiveWire Studio, and um, but it's all on my. Uh, vanromaine.com and on my Instagram and on my Facebook. So it's really easy to get in touch here, but it's, um, you know, I guess half the time I'm putting drums on, on people's records and I just finished 12 songs on, uh, like a great hard rock, rock record, this band, the defiance. And, uh, um, but I can also multi-track bands here. There's amps upstairs. Oh, great. And they stay, stay snake down here. I don't have a separate control room, but I actually like not having that. I like to have uh, open space because I get together with people and write here. And I, I don't always want the, um, I mean, I don't have a ton of space, but it's, uh, but I got large sounding drum rooms, like two or three different uh, ambient mics and stereo sets of ambient mics on the kit and uh but i you know i can i can track full bands here and everyone has their own headphone mix when i do that and been a little less of that it's starting to happen again now right now that things are opening up a little bit so i've been in very cool studio spaces that don't have control rooms there's one in the uh do you know long pond no where's that it's it's in the it's in stuyvesant new york it's where i live uh oh yeah it's the National guys, the guys from that okay. band, the National. Their studio is amazing. No control room. One uh -huh. ISO room. And the great recordings. Yeah, it, it. I got the idea from a friend of mine, Pete Min, who used to have a great studio in 
Brooklyn. Now he's out in L.A. And he does have a control in L.A. now. Bigger place. But, uh, yeah, just some of the best sounding recordings. And he knew how to, you know, get it going with headphones on with the mics. And then, obviously, we would listen without the headphones <laughs> to takes, right. do a little take and can easily hear the way things are really sounding and uh um but yeah i've got uh you know a ton of different mics from different endorsements and other things mics i've invested on and api mic pre's mostly and but a combination of different things and um this studio used to be um in new york in the lower east side right and i just moved this you know it's got sound panels and um I don't know how much you can see of it, but this is the main main drum room, and there's a cloud above me here, and um, Carter's coming back in for a hello. Big C. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's awesome. It's great, and I'm uh, just really happy. And I, I found out, you know, you don't always need a, a massive A room at the power station to get a great drum sound. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate the A room with the power station. Don't get me wrong, but so. is there a a new spot now in Connecticut? That's what I've heard. Is it Connecticut or Massachusetts? I, I so friends, I haven't been there yet, but it's modeled after that. I feel like after the after the A room, maybe even Richard told me that. Like he was like, "Oh yeah, there's like a yeah." Richard was there. Duplicate, yeah, like I, a, it's basically I saw he posted thing. something. He did something there. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, Crazy. yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to check that out. And then, you know, Berkeley owns Avatar. What's the that? one, the one that's still in Manhattan. Right. Just now called Avatar. I'm pretty sure it's still called Avatar or is they calling it the power station again? I don't know. I, don't I have know. a, I have the Avatar plug in. <laughs> <laughs> that's great but uh yeah berkeley college of music bought bought it and owns it wow so the record companies aren't keeping it alive <laughs> but music school is you know whatever so um i've had a really great time Boy. talking with you I'm, it's uh yeah uh, I think the, all these successes couldn't have come to a a, a more humble and gentle. Oh fella, man, thank you, brother. Like. Well, and, well, well, feelings are mutual. I appreciate that. So, oh. um, I'm really happy that you. I mean, it's cool to hear you talk about getting back to playing with Enrique, and uh, I wish you guys the best of luck with your gigs and and next Thank year you. especially when you get to go hit it hard. Yeah, we, we had a good year in 2021 for we did like 30 cities in the U.S., which is without getting canceled. You know, that uh, was a tight ship. That was a double co-headline thing with uh, Ricky Martin. We'd flip flop each night and um, and. Uh, yeah, no, nobody tested positive, and we, it wasn't. We weren't living in uh, quarantine jail necessarily. I mean, but you know, no guests were allowed backstage, and there were other protocols that were smart. And uh, I mean, but it was hugely su right? successful. And now uh, this year's a little bit more mellow with that. But uh, yeah, gives me more time to get in more trouble here and and more live shows with other people. So. Awesome. Well, I would I would encourage anyone to get in touch with you and uh, and seek out your playing. Yeah, anyone who needs help, you know, drumming or production or otherwise, and um, um, and uh, I know tons of people too. Like if if I'm not necessarily the perfect thing, I know who he is. So you know, awesome. yeah. So. Um, I imagine you are a fella who might have a couple of high res photos of yourself on stage playing the drums. Yeah. Would you uh, would you send me a couple that I could sure. mangle and and make some posts? Absolutely. Excellent. So just just of me, not of the band or anything. Yeah, I, I'll okay. I'll probably remove the background and uh, put up a twinkling sky or okay. something. Gotcha. Carter. Okay. 
Cordell. Look at that big old Cordell. neck. Look at that big old neck. Huh? Look at those chompers. <laughs> what a what a big dude. Yeah. He's a riot. Um oh. <laughs> Somebody wants to play. Yeah. I I thank you so much for uh giving me so much of your time this evening. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Uh if you haven't heard it today, you're great. Thanks, man. Thanks. Um, have a great night. Uh, this will go up on Monday. Okay. Um, this yeah. week, I normally, through Drummer Awareness um, Month, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm ah. going to kill this.